Isn't that a beautiful hymn? It's one of my favorites. I think if we were to sing it as often as I would like, you would get tired of it. So, <laughs> Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the mercy of God in the flesh. Pumpkin farmer was walking uh, through his pumpkin patch one day, uh, checking the health of his plants and uh, taking a look at the buds and the little small pumpkins that were beginning to grow, took a few more steps walking along there, tripped over a clear glass jar. What was this clear glass jar doing in his pumpkin patch? He, he didn't know. And so the pumpkin farmer decided, uh, uh, just for a little bit of fun, to take this, this clear glass jar and slide it over one of the pumpkin buds. It was just going to be an experiment for him. He wanted to see what would happen to the pumpkin as it grew inside of that clear glass jar. Well, he soon forgot all about this glass jar experiment. A few months later, he's walking through his pumpkin patch again, and he trips over that same glass jar, and he was shocked at what he saw. That clear glass jar was full of orange, an orange mass, a pumpkin. The pumpkin had filled this clear glass jar, but... That pumpkin had only grown to about a third of its intended size. What happens to pumpkins in clear glass jars is what happens to you and to me. It's what often happens to churches. Rather than growing and developing to our full potential, rather than growing to our God-given intended size, many churches grow to about a third of their God-intended size. Rather than grow and flourish, many churches conform to the shape of the culture and their surroundings. And what happens when churches are confined by these invisible barriers? Well, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, uh, spiritual growth gets stymied. Evangelistic outreach uh, doesn't happen. Compassionate and caring concern for others is curtailed. Churches only grow to about one-third of their God-intended size. Every church, including our church, needs to assess itself on occasion and, and figure out what are the clear glass jars that are stymieing us. What are those invisible barriers that lead us to say, well, I, I guess this is good enough, about a third of what God intends. What are those clear glass jars for you? What are those clear glass jars for us here at our Savior Lutheran Church? So over the next five weeks or so, we're going to take a, a hammer and we're going to break those clear glass jars because as always, uh, since 1974, the members of this church want to grow and flourish in the name of Jesus. We're beginning a new sermon series that we're calling The Church's One Foundation. We're going to be staying in the book of Romans, uh, looking at selected verses in Romans so that we can begin identifying and breaking clear glass jars, get rid of those invisible barriers so that we can develop and flourish and grow to our full potential. Today we're going to begin with the mandate, the, the foundation. What is our mandate here at our Savior Lutheran Church? Now, of course, a mandate is not a suggestion, is it? It's not an invitation. No, a mandate is a, it's a decree. It's an order. It's a command. It's God's marching orders for his church. And the mandate uh, comes from the most pivotal verse in Romans. Paul begins with these words in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... Therefore, it's a connecting word. Paul is assuming that we know the first 11 chapters of Romans. Uh, therefore, in light of those first 11 chapters of Romans, I urge you, brothers, I beseech you, I command you, I mandate you to what? Before you do anything, you do it in view of God's mercy. Nothing will happen if we don't get a fresh, Holy Spirit-inspired view of God's mercy. Now, the definition of mercy in the New Testament is this. God's compassionate action toward desperate people. That's what mercy is in the New Testament. God's compassionate, huge word, compassionate. God has a heart. 
God's compassionate action. God has more than, than a heart. He does something toward who? Desperate people. And guess what? All of us are desperate people. Long ago, Aristotle said that God is an unmoved mover. No, Aristotle got it wrong. God is not an unmoved mover. God is mercy. Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of our country, uh, he was a deist. Uh, Jefferson said that God is a watchmaker uh, God. He, he created everything and then he wound it all up and just sort of stepped aside. God is not an unmoved mover. Aristotle had it wrong. God is not a watchmaker God. Thomas Jefferson had it wrong. God is a God of mercy, compassionate action toward desperate people. Star Wars, everyone knows Star Wars. Star Wars got it wrong. Star Wars says God is a mighty force. No, no, no. God is a person. He has a name, Yahweh. He is a person that is full of mercy. If there is one word that defines God, it's not, it's not unmoved mover, it's not watchmaker, it's not force, it's mercy. And the first 11 chapters of Romans is all about mercy. They are chock full of God's compassionate decision to rescue desperate, needy, broken, messed up fools like you and me through Jesus. Paul's been building for 11 chapters to finally get to Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. The first 11 chapters of Romans are like a, a massive tsunami of mercy. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Romans 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 3, 23 and 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's the desperate people. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Folks, there's a word for that, and that word is mercy. Romans 4, 25, he was delivered over. He, Jesus, delivered over for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Meet Mr. Mercy. Delivered over for our sins, Paul says. Raised again. Raised again for our justification. There's Mr. Mercy. Paul's just getting started. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's marvelous. Marvelous mercy. Romans 5 20, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. We call that multiplied mercy. You see, Romans 1, Romans chapter 1 through Romans 11 would be this, these marvelous, huge, huge mountains of mercy where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's miraculous mercy. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's mercy upon mercy, and it all flows from Mr. Mercy himself. Finally, Romans 8, verse 39, nothing, 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 nothing in all of God's creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, folks, is magnificent mercy. Like I said, it's a tsunami wave of mercy, God's compassionate action toward desperate people like us. Your life is not defined by the wreckage of your past. Your life is not defined by your constant struggle with sin. Your life is not defined by guilt and shame and emptiness and broken relationships. No, your life, my life is defined by one word. And what would that one word be? You know it by now. Mercy. <laughs> Mercy. Marvelous, multiplied, magnificent mercy. God's compassionate action toward desperate people. Paul says, he says that we'll just sit in our pews. We won't do anything in the name of Jesus unless we get this fresh view in our heart and in our head of this mercy. So what's the problem? 
Well, uh, communism says that the problem is private property. Globalism says that our problem is nationalism. Sigmund Freud says that our problem is our parents, right? <laughs> he may be onto something there. <laughs> Environmentalists say that the problem is our exploitation of the earth. Uh, educators, of course, say that the problem is ignorance. Folks, they've all got it wrong. What's the problem? Well, Paul says this is the problem, the, the root of the problem. Romans 7, verse 24, he says, What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? That's the problem. Sin, uh, selfishness, narcissism. Uh, the problem isn't out there somewhere. No, no, no. The problem, the problem is right here. And what's the solution? Well, you know by now, don't you? The solution is mercy. Uh, Mr. Mercy himself, Jesus. So it all begins. This whole idea of breaking glass jars, it all begins in view of God's mercy. And so in view of God's mercy, we, we make a great commitment. A great commitment. Paul says, Romans 12, verse 1, we make a great commitment to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In view of this marvelous, multiplied, magnificent mercy, we make a great commitment to offer your bodies. And that means your, your hands, it means your feet, your ears, your eyes, your, your intellect, your mouth, our entire bodies. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, if you know anything at all about the Old uh, Testament, there's no such thing as a living sacrifice in the Old Testament, right? They're all dead. I mean, that's the point of a sacrifice. You take a ram, a lamb, a goat, a bull, and you, you kill it. A living sacrifice is a, is a contradiction of terms. It's, like, it's a paradox. It's an oxymoron. It, it makes no sense at all. It's like uh, putting together uh, two words like, like jumbo shrimp or government efficiency or Oklahoma University football. <laughs> <laughs> Doug almost said UT football this morning. <laughs> or short sermon. <laughs> Almost lived that one through, huh? <laughs> I mean, those words just don't connect, uh, do they? They don't make sense. Living sacrifice is, is like that. So what is a living sacrifice? Paul helps us out. Uh, in Romans 6, verse 11, he says, uh, Consider yourselves dead to sin. And alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, that's the sacrifice part. You're dead to sin. Now, God not only gives us forgiveness for our sins, He gives us power over sin. I, I don't need to be a slave to sin anymore. I'm dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. A living sacrifice means that you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're dead to yourself, but alive to Jesus. Anybody have a, a bacon and egg breakfast this morning? No? Wow. Uh, let me ask you this. In a bacon and egg breakfast, what's the difference between the chicken and the pig? The chicken's involved, right? The pig. <laughs> the pig is committed. <laughs> well, I'm involved, Pastor. I show up. I'm here. Well, folks, God's not asking for you to get involved. God is asking you to be committed. A great commitment means more than involvement. It means sacrifice. It means giving everything. It's no longer good enough in view of God's mercy to be the chicken with the eggs. No. And don't take offense to this, but God is looking for pigs. <laughs> God is looking for a complete commitment. In view of God's mercy, Paul, Paul says, make a great commitment, not a half-hearted commitment, uh, not to put my toe in the water kind of commitment. No, in view of God's mercy, I dive in. I make a great commitment. A great commitment to what? To the great commandment. 
What's the great commandment? Well, Jesus spells it out for us. Matthew chapter 22, he says, The great commandment is to, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, it's all about loving God by loving your neighbor. And so I make a great commitment, not abstractly, but very concretely to people. And Paul picks up on that in Romans chapter 13. He says, whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So what is love? Well, love is not just a feeling, is it? I mean, I can lose that love and feeling. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of love, but that's not the kind of love that Paul is talking about here. No, I make a great commitment to the great commandment to love, to love my neighbor as myself. At a place called Three Mills Green, uh, just east of London, England, about 100 years or so ago, there was a, a worker at a well, and he was overcome by carbonic acid at this well, and he began choking and dying. And so one of his fellow workers came along and, and lent a hand and started uh, pulling him up out of the well. And that man, too, was quickly overcome by the acid. And so a second man came, and still a third man came, and all three of those men died trying to get that first man who was overcome out of that well. And at Three Mills Green, uh, east of London, they erected this, this worker's memorial dedicated to what love looks like. These men who showed love to their neighbor, not, not the kind of love that says, I'll be there if you need me, and yet never shows up, just words, not action. No, the kind of love that, that gets involved the kind of love that lives for others, the kind of love that, that gives rather than gets, love that, that doesn't seek to be served but to serve others. Love is, is, is getting up out of the pews and lending a hand to our neighbors in need. That's what this memorial is all about. These two hands connected to one another. That, that's a, a great commitment to who? To my neighbor in need. Now, most churches, in, including our church, most churches measure success by, by bodies, buildings, and budgets, right? I mean, if we have enough bodies in the pews and we've got enough uh, buildings and we've got the budget, then we're successful. Uh, God is after more than bodies, buildings, and budgets. There's nothing wrong with, with asking how many or how much, but God says the ultimate measure of a church is, is love. How, how loving are we? How connected are we uh, not only to one another, but to those outside of our church? So Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. A great commitment to the great commandment. Be connected. Love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on in Romans to say, make a great commitment to the great commission. And we all know the great commission, right? Uh, we heard it in Matthew 28 this morning. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Some of you may have also heard this. Uh, the great commission quite often becomes the great omission. It's as though all God expects of this church is to take care of 1400 North Meadows Drive, Granbury, Texas, 76048. No. Oh. There are people outside of our walls, aren't they? In those apartment complexes, in the schools, across the street, in our immediate neighborhood, in our city, and in our county, in Texas, in North America, in the world. God has more than just 1400 North Meadows Drive. Paul, writing to this church in Rome, he wants this church in Rome to think outside of itself. Now, that's why he, he writes these words. He's writing from Corinth, and he's going to Rome. It's about 56 A.D., but he's finally wanting to go to Spain. He says, I plan to go to Spain. Paul wants the believers in Rome to not just think Rome, but to think Spain. Think beyond the walls. Uh, many of you know this. When I was in high school and in college as well, I, I drove a 1976 red Ford uh, Courier, and it, it worked quite well. It got me to where I needed to go. Uh, but after a few years and, and after I had to uh, rebuild the engine, and just a handful of parts left over, 
it began to develop a few other problems. I could still drive it around town just fine, but when I would get it out on the highway and go about 60, 65 miles an hour, it began to, to shimmy and it would shake and rattle and roll. It was like it was about to fall apart. But the problem, the problem wasn't the engine that I had rebuilt. The problem, of course, was the front end, right? It, it needed an alignment. As a church, we need to get aligned. I mean, we can't just put our foot on the gas pedal and, and start driving down the highway. No, we need to be aligned with God's purposes. And what are God's purposes? Paul says the Great Commission. Think outside of ourselves. Think outside of our walls. Think Spain. In view of God's mercy, it all starts there. In view of God's mercy, make a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. And this builds what? A mediocre church? A, a sleeping church? A disconnected church? No. It builds a great church. The church of God in Rome was a great church. Talk about uh, being connected to Christ and to each other and to the world. Uh, look how Paul describes some of these members of this church in Rome. In Romans 16, verses 1 to 13, Paul lists 29 people. That's unprecedented in Paul's letters. 29 different people. He says, uh, Phoebe, whoever Phoebe was, uh, Phoebe has been a great help to me. You could count on Phoebe. Uh, she, she wasn't just there. She She's committed. Priscilla and Aquila, they risked their lives for me. Mary worked very hard for you. Urbanus is a fellow worker in Christ. Apelles is tested and approved in Christ. And Rufus is chosen in the Lord. And his mother has been a mother to me too. What a church. This mercy of God brought, brought people together. Uh, they weren't just involved. They were committed they had a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. And God in Rome built a great church. Everybody here is a baseball fan, right? Sure. Astros fans, yes? October 15, 1981, Game 4 of the American League Championship Series between the New York Yankees and the Oakland A's being played in Yankee Stadium. Bottom of the sixth inning, Yankees are behind. A man named George Henderson was at the game that day, and he happened to bring a drum uh, with him that day. He was sitting up there, and he started beating his drum, and he created the first stadium wave. And we, we all know what a wave is, right? I mean, you, uh, a lot of people stand up together and raise their arms in the air, and that action kind of continues around the stadium. Looks maybe something like that. It's the fans' way of encouraging, uh, rallying the home team. First sports wave happened in Yankee Stadium, October the 15th, 1981. And don't ask me who won, but because I forgot. Someone once called the wave a collective expression of passion released. Did you love that? A collective expression of passion released. That's what God wants here at our Savior Lutheran Church, a collective expression of passion released. Not just within our walls, but especially extending outside of our walls. God is calling for waves of gospel revolution marked with changed lives by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. But, but to do that, uh, here at our Savior Lutheran Church, we need a drum, don't we? We need the beat. We need something to get us started. What would that be? What is our drum what is going to get us moving in the name of Jesus? Well, Paul, Paul again, he tells us very clearly, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. <laughs> mercy. Mercy is the drumbeat whereby we are empowered to make a great commitment to the great commandment of love and the great commission to make disciples of all nations, and that will build an even greater church. All God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing, shall we?